Drew, how are you? How are you, man? Doing well. Um, let's jump right into it with the Iron Bowl. You've had a couple of days now to not only, uh, you know, what did you watch it the first time around, but I'm sure you've gone back through it. And it's a really an amazing football game from my standpoint, uh, like we've seen others with Alabama and Auburn, where Alabama, I thought physically, um, outplayed Auburn. And I thought uh, did so many good things in the game and, and uh, you know, probably should have won the football game. But the scoreboard's what matters, and uh, Auburn played a cleaner game. They didn't have as many mistakes. They ca- they capitalized on Alabama's mistakes, and at the end of the day, uh, they got out of there with a 48-45 victory. But if you told me before the game that Alabama, that Matt Jones would throw for 335 and four touchdowns, Alabama would have over 500 yards of offense, would score 45 points, uh, I would have told you Alabama would have won the game comfortably. So it really was a strange football game. Uh, now that you've had a little bit of time to analyze it, uh, what do you make of it? Well, I mean, it just was a symptom of the of the season as a whole. It was a lot of, in a lot of ways. It was a a lot of the same uh, kind of uh, breakdowns that we saw against LSU. Alabama made two fatal mistakes offensively uh, with the two pick sixes, giving Auburn fourteen points. Uh, certainly, uh, they cost themselves points with their turnovers against LSU as well. And uh, they had a drop snap in the LSU game in the kicking game this time. Uh, they have a late missed field goal, but they also had a situation where Trevon Diggs jumped off sides uh, and gave Auburn a first down, allowing a drive to continue. So they had just enough mistakes in the kicking game. Uh, and then defensively, uh, Alabama, the standard has been set so high by Nick Saban's group from 2008 through 2017, Gary. Uh, but for the last two years, there, there, you know, there just hasn't been a margin for error for this Alabama offense. And I know it was just one game last year against Clemson, but if you go back and and and, and, and look at the 2018 season, Tua Vailoa and that offense uh, covered up a lot of things uh, that 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 defense didn't do well at times against quality competition. And once again, that reared its ugly head against Auburn, like it did against LSU. They can't get off the field on third down, especially third down and long. Uh, tackling is not very good. Uh, they're not playing physical football. The pass rush wasn't what Alabama wanted it to be. Some of that has to do with the youth that they're playing against. But, Gary, the thing is, uh, you what you want to see is progress. And while it was thought that Alabama was improving toward the middle of the season, I think it was mainly just uh, they weren't playing great competition. And when they play against the LSUs and the Auburns and Auburn is certainly a top 12 to 15 team in the country, despite the three losses because of the schedule they played. Alabama, they just lost. The, the standard of excellence is not there right now defensively. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, there's a, there's things that need to change, especially from a coaching standpoint and player development. And uh, because right now, to be frank, Alabama plays defense like a Big 12 team, and that can't sit well with Nick Saban being the defensive guy that he is. Drew, I hear you, and and I and I agree with you to an extent. Uh, but I know I think maybe we have different philosophies on this. But it's not just Alabama. I mean, it's hard to play the kind of defense you're referencing today. And I'm not making any excuses. I'm just being honest. Um, and you look what happened to LSU in one year. I think they went from average and you know giving up in the in the mid teens per game to you know well over twenty points per game. Uh, when you have a dynamic offense and the way the rules are set up, it, it's it's tough to have a, a smothering defense. I mean, you everybody talked about Auburn. Auburn's vaunted defense. Auburn got gashed Saturday. Gashed, Drew. I mean, Alabama went up and down the field all day on them. Granted, there were mistakes, and they had two pick sixes, and that's to their credit. So I hear what you're saying, but if you're if you're if you're wanting to see a defense go back to 2011 standards, that's not going to happen, in my opinion. Well, it's not, but uh, but what you want to see is you want to see better fundamentals, uh, less penalties, uh, better tackling, uh, you know, being able to play the ball in coverage. Uh, like this Alabama secondary, and Xavier McKinney's had a heck of a season. They're probably the best safety, in my opinion, in the SEC. He's had a better year than Grant Delphit. I agree Delphi with came you. came into the, the season with all the accolades. But I just think overall you saw Trevon Diggs, Patrick Sertain, uh, even uh, you know, Shy Carter. None of they didn't have the years that we were anticipating. 
and, and again, I, I agree, Gary. You're not going to – this is not going to be a deal where you shut everybody down to seven points or ten points and, and you dominate and suffocate people. Alabama used to be known for suffocating. Right. But uh, Alabama gave up 130 yards rushing per game this year. That's, that's not where Nick Saban wants to see it. He wants to see it under 100. And – uh, you know, you want to be able to force more turnovers, be more disruptive. That's what you have to be to win this day and time. To me, it, it, I guess the example is Auburn scored 34 points in the game, Gary. Alabama needs to cut that to, you know, to 17 to 24, you know. And if you can hold the team with, uh, around three touchdowns, especially with a dynamic offense, you ought to feel pretty good about it. But uh, LSU had a dynamic offense. They put, you know, 46 on Alabama. Uh, Auburn – but see, and that's the thing that I guess should bother an Alabama fan. Auburn is not dynamic offensively, right. and yet they still score, you know, thirty-four points because Alabama has having trouble with third-down defense. And I didn't think they defended the run all that well, Gary. I thought Raekwon Davis individually had a good game, but when you give Auburn one hundred and eighty yards rushing, if you look at Bo Nix's stat line, it wasn't great. Mac Jones really outplayed him. But the, 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 but the hidden yards are there. Auburn made plays when they had to, and they took advantage of short fields uh, due to a, a big-time punt return, too, that they got from Christian Tut to get a touchdown early. So there was a lot of hidden things. Uh, you know, I, I do think if they played eight, uh, ten times, Alabama would win eight of those Iron Bowls, even with Mac Jones. And that shows how elite this offense is. Mac Jones is a backup quarterback. I think Alabama, I'll say this, Gary, in the SEC, and that includes LSU. I think Alabama is probably the only team in the league that would have a backup quarterback that could come in and perform like Mac Jones did. And it, 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 it's a credit to, to uh, Steve Sarkeesian and the talent around uh, the quarterback that Alabama's got. It's just sad that defensively there are so many deficiencies right now that uh, this elite offense that we've seen, really the best I've ever seen at Alabama, is not going to get a chance to play for a championship yeah, now. Yeah, it's, it's strange. Back to the defense, and, and we'll get to the possibility of, of, you know, staff changes in a moment. But you did mention the injuries, and I have to ask you, I mean, how much uh, can you attribute the defensive issues to, to, you know, nothing against Christian Harris and, and Shane Lee, but they weren't supposed to be playing other than as, you know, part-time guys playing backup roles. You start a freshman nose tackle. He goes down, DJ Dell. You've got uh, Barmore, who's who's talented, but early in the year was playing mop up duty. Uh, I mean, you look all over the field. You know, no LeBron Ray. I mean, in fairness to the defensive staff, I mean, a lot of defenses uh, would have, you know, had issues with how much they lost. It's just bad luck. I understand that, but how much of a difference would some of those guys that I mentioned have made on this defensive squad this year? If you've got Dylan Moses, if you've got Josh McMillan, if you've got LeBron Ray, if you've got DJ Dale all year, other guys up front missed time. Um, you know, even the secondary had a, had a few guys dinged up. How big a part was that in this defense not having a, a typical Alabama year? It certainly played a part, Gary. I mean, but I will say this, and you never know until a season plays itself out. I made the statement, you know, uh, that I thought Alabama at the beginning of the year had a chance to be a lead on both sides of the ball if they stayed healthy. Uh, due to Tua Tungvaloa and all the uh, talent coming back at the skill positions, the offensive line, uh, with Landon Dickerson joining the mix and, and making the impact that he made, because uh, it looked like he was going to make an impact in the preseason. But then I also said they had to stay healthy on defense with, with uh, guys like Dylan Moses, who I said was the key piece, uh, and even Joshua McMillan. They didn't stay healthy. Then LeBron Ray, who got preseason all-SEC accolades, he gets hurt as well. Certainly that made a difference. And I do think if this group had been healthy, Gary, uh, that Alabama would be undefeated right now and headed into the college football playoff. But I will say, you know, much like last year, uh, you know, I, and I was guilty of it as well. I glossed over it because of the productivity of the offense. I felt like Alabama could get good enough defensive play, and with this elite offense, could go 15 and 0. They ran into a hot quarterback and a very good football team in Clemson, and and the, and the run ended, and they were and they did not play well in the national championship game. But based on what I saw out of this coaching staff, just the way. Because the secondary is very experienced, Gary, and the secondary has been very disappointing. Uh, and then, and then, really, we haven't seen the productivity out of the D line. Now, part of that's DJ Dale and Brian Ray and having to play some youth. But part of that, we, you know, 
Raekwon was a good player, not a great player. Uh, and then we, we didn't see, you know, a dominant play from, from uh, the, uh, the front as a whole. Christian Barmore finally came into his own. But I will say, even if this team were completely healthy, based on what I've seen out of the coaching staff defensively, not offensively, just on defense, I think this team would be in the college football playoff playing for an SEC title but I don't think they would have won the national championship much like a year ago because, quite frankly, I just don't see a championship-level coaching staff on defense. And, again, that goes back to Nick Saban. It all, he is the one that makes the hire, so he, he falls at his feet. And, but no coach is infallible. Coach Bryant wasn't. But I just think uh, with what, what, what the biggest loss for Alabama has been, the continuity on the coaching staff, they've lost so many really good coaches since 2011-2012 that I think it's finally caught up with Alabama. You know, Nick Saban took a chance to me on Pete Golding, being a young defensive coordinator, trying to groom him to be the next Kirby Smart, uh, Jeremy Pruitt, uh, you know, even, uh, of course, Will Muschamp. I just don't think he's an elite guy. And I think Alabama, some of the other hires they made, maybe called the Call Scott situation. Also, Brian Baker has not, I don't think, done a great job with the D-line. He's done okay. I just don't think the staff, though, is good enough on defense to win a championship. So are you suggesting that they need to make more changes? I mean, you mentioned continuity, yet uh, you know the staff has received some heat. It's hard to build continuity if you're changing out the coaches every year, Drew. It is, but you just have to get the right mix. And Alabama was very fortunate, Gary. I mean, during their run with Nick Saban, uh, now Will Muschamp was never here, but he was with Coach Saban at LSU and did a great job there and helped them build an outstanding program and a championship program. Uh, and then Alabama was very fortunate that Kirby Smart stayed for nearly a decade. Because you don't really see that anymore. He was very patient and methodical in getting his opportunity to go back to his alma mater at Georgia and revive them, which he has done. And they certainly have become a you know maybe a top six, seven, eight program in the country. They've played for uh, they've won SEC championships. Uh, they've, they've played for a national title. So they were very fortunate to have Kirby Smart stay as long as he did. And then to have a guy like Jeremy Pruitt leave the program, go win a championship at FSU, go to Georgia, but then come back to Alabama and help them win another one. They were very fortunate there. So, and a lot of that is timing and circumstance. But right now, uh, when you build the beast, you got to feed it. And so uh, eventually a lot of that can catch up with you, and I think it has with Coach Saban. But I do still think he's the best I've ever seen at, at, at building a staff. And so – while the last two years have been rough, I, certainly you only uh, it, it's kind of like the old Coach Bryant quote. You know, you you, you have to lose, uh, to, you know, to to have humility and to, and to learn how to handle adversity. And certainly, any any program uh, is going to have adversity. Now Nick Saban has faced it, and for him to finish out his legacy, if he wants to become, he has a chance. He's in the very short list of the greatest to ever do it, and the way he handled this next year or two to try to finish out his run at Alabama, he's, he can, he's got a chance still to be the greatest that's ever done it if he's not already. And so I'm going to be interested to see how he, uh, he handles this opportunity because, again, I just I know what the standard Nick Saban wants is, and I, just, I can't believe that what he's seen on defense the last two years has pleased him. He made changes last year, and I think he'll make them again. You just got to see if he can get it right this time. But it's tough because, as you said, the rules are changing. Uh, there's a lot of great programs. And, heck, man, uh, Nick Saban, we've never seen a coach have the kind of uh, impact uh, on the culture of the SEC that Coach Saban has. So many of his former staffers are in this league. And I was on my show this morning, Gary. There may be two more of his former pupils that join the SEC as head coaches in the coming days because I'm hearing Lane Kiffin is on the very short list at Arkansas, and Billy Napier may be the next coach of the Ole Miss Rebels. So, uh, it's it's going to get tougher every year, but Nick Saban's still the standard, and I still believe that he knows that this program needs – there's some things that need to be tweaked and fixed, and I think he's going to do that. All right, more with Judy Arman coming up on the other side of this break. The Rocket Man from 97.7 ESPN in Huntsville. Welcome back in to the Gary Harris Show. A few more minutes with Drudy Arman from 97.7 ESPN Radio in Huntsville. Let's jump right back out on the Bud Light Hotline. Drew, I, I want to talk a little more Iron Bowl. 
It's just, uh, it's uncanny, really, and I guess that's what makes a great rivalry is that Nick Saban, all the dominance that he's had, he hasn't lost to Tennessee since he's been at Alabama. He's lost to Mississippi State once. He's lost to Ole Miss twice. Uh, even with the loss this year against LSU, still has a, you know, he's got a sterling record against most everybody in the SEC, but give Auburn credit. Uh, he's 8-5 and five against them, which is good, but by his standards, certainly not great. Up against the greatest dynasty in maybe the history of college football, they've managed to win one national championship in 2010. They played for another in 2013. They've had you know a season in which they went three and nine and didn't win an SEC game, and have you know bounced back the next year and under Gus Malzahn, as I said, played for a national championship. They have been a thorn in Alabama's side, particularly there at, at Jordan Hare, and pulling games out that, uh, quite frankly. You know, maybe they shouldn't have won. Uh, I guess that is just the rivalry aspect. What is it about Auburn that uh, they've given Alabama more trouble than anybody else in this league? Well, it's just the rivalry, Gary. It means so much to both sides. Uh, you know, especially, you know, uh, Auburn, uh, They, uh, I think uh, more than any other game, they want to beat Alabama uh, and because uh, and I guess they, they measure themselves against the Crimson Tide, you know, constantly. Uh, Alabama has been the standard, not just in the SEC, but in college football. And so Alabama gets everybody's best shot, but especially from Auburn, because they want to continue, uh, the, you know, they want to you know, win championships in their own right. They've won one in 2010. They played for one in 2013. I think it's a, a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, bell- I think feather in the cap for the state. I, I know we hear all the time nationally that Ohio State and Michigan is the uh, in, in a lot of people's eyes, is the number one rivalry in college football. That's complete garbage. It should be the Iron Bowl. It's Alabama and Auburn. In, in, in the in, in, right now, in the uh, in Ohio State, Michigan, the, the Buckeyes have won 15 out of 16. Gary, that's not a rivalry. That's somebody getting drilled and getting yeah. their ass beat every year. I mean, that, that's kind of like where Alabama and Tennessee is right now. And Alabama's put 13 for the most part beat downs on Tennessee. Every year, it's been pretty much 13 beat downs and maybe two close. Or excuse me, 11 beat downs and two close games in the 13 uh, game streak for Alabama. But the, but the game, but the series against Auburn, there's not been a lot of streak. Uh, you know, I, uh, even with Nick Saban here and what he's done, Auburn's as you said, it's eight and five. Auburn's won five of them, and there's been some classic games in the series. So it's a credit to both universities. I think it's a very competitive rivalry with a lot of juice. It creates a lot of headlines. Uh, and I think it's the number one rivalry in college football. I really don't think it's close. I don't really care about Ohio State and Michigan. I guess maybe more the rest of the country does because they have Alabama fatigue. But I really think it's a true rivalry, unlike uh, right now with Ohio State just dominating Jim Harbaugh. All right. I, I want to ask you just your thoughts on Alabama's kicking game. Alabama has been elite under Nick Saban in every area place kicking aside where they are last in his 13 years here in missed field goals 101 of them including another one on Saturday from 30 yards out that was huge Uh, when Alabama has lost games uh, very often it's been in direct correlation to not being able to make field goals whether it was 2011 against LSU 2013 against Auburn and we've seen other games and and they've recruited well it's not like they've recruited kickers that weren't highly touted about everyone that they've brought in here including the two on the roster now were considered a lead out of high school Adam Griffith was the number one kicker in the country they took him and passed on the first Carlson which then led them to not being able to recruit the second Carlson and those two Carlson brothers have, have been as good of kickers probably in college football as, as we've seen what's your theory I mean, is it is it mental? Is it just is it just something that when you get here, you know the history of place kicking and you can't come through? It doesn't seem to matter, you know, who the kicker is or what the situation is. Oftentimes, Alabama comes up short in that area. What do you make of it? It's hard to make anything of it, Gary, because it, as we know, Alabama was very fortunate in the late '80s and early '90s to have great kick. Indeed. I mean, and they they had Van Tiffin, Philip Doyle, and Michael Proctor. They were all outstanding. So it was, this hex was never talked about. It just seems to be the one thing in Nick Saban's program that hasn't been consistent as far as excellence. Uh, you know, they did finally figure the punting out with J.K. Scott. He had an outstanding four-year career. He's now the starting punter for the Green Bay Packers. 
Uh, I still think Will Reichert has a chance to be the best of the Saban era. I've, but his injury, Gary, has not been talked about nearly as much as LeBron Ray and and Dylan Moses and Joshua McMillan and uh, and of the and Tua Tungo Vailoa. But it may have been as big as any of them. True. Because I really think I know he had missed a few kicks early. He was four out of seven. But I think he was starting to get comfortable, Gary. I really do, and I think that really hurt Alabama. I don't. I think Bullivis has been okay, but he's been inconsistent his entire career. That's why I wasn't shocked when he missed the thirty yarder. And I'm not blaming Joseph Bullivis here. Look, man, they lost the game by giving up pick sixes, by making mistakes, other mistakes in the kicking game, such as the offsides of Trevon Diggs. And quite frankly, I'll be honest with you. If Joseph Bulavos kicks it right down the middle, and before he missed that kick, Gary, he really had a solid game. Made every extra point. He kicked a 43-yard field goal on the first drive when a touchdown. Once again, a mistake by Alabama. And could the call was it called iffy on the hold? Yeah, but they called the holding penalty. He erased a Henry Ruggs touchdown. Uh, he, he had had a really nice game. He just misses this kick. It's almost like a symptom. But again, I just think overall, it's one of those things. It's hard to explain. But I think uh, that uh, I don't think it's been for lack of emphasis. I think they tried to hire Jeff Banks. He's supposed to be a guru coming in. I think it's just been some, uh, really, just some frankly bad luck for Alabama. Uh, and uh, I just, but I will say, people do forget. Like in 2015, if it wasn't for the onside kick and some big kicks that Adam Griffith made during that season, they wouldn't have won the national championship. So yes, the the, the missed field goals are mystifying. I don't really think you can explain it, but I do think that Will Reichert's injury, which is hopefully going to lead to a red shirt. I know he kicked in five games, and really four games in one play. I hope Alabama could still appeal and get his red shirt because I wouldn't expect him to kick in the bowl game. But if he can get healthy, I still think some of those, maybe those woes can be solved. We'll see. But uh, I just think uh, overall, it's just been something that's mystifying. It's really, really hard to explain. Great stuff, Drew, as always. Two segments just isn't enough, it seems like. We always run short of time. But uh, thank you, Drew. And follow Drew, folks, on Twitter at 977 ESPN. Thank you. Thank you, Gary.